Welcome to the latest webinar from Save the High Street Org in our series, Succeed During Lockdown. Uh, I'm going to make a few introductory points um, before introducing today's panelists. If you have questions for us, please pop them in the, um, let's see, the chat box, which is kind of in the middle of your screen there. Um, and then we can ask the questions of the panelists. So, Save the High Street itself, if you're not familiar with this, exists to save the high street one business and one good idea at a time. And if you go away today with just one good idea, we will count that a success. Now, there is a reductionist view that a business is essentially some people and some money trying to make more money than they start out with. Cash is often described as the lifeblood of a business, but it's more fundamental than that. It's oxygen. And as with a human being, a human being can't survive for more than five or 10 minutes without oxygen, without serious damage or death. The same is true of a business. That challenge is more difficult to get right just now than at any time I can remember. We're into the ninth month of a serious business disruption. And in England, we've got the second lockdown of the year non-essential retail, and we are a high street organisation, hospitality and service are shut for face-to-face -face businesses, with the added sting that large food and general purpose businesses are open and trading full pelt in the run-up to Christmas. The ONS, though, tells us that overall retail sales are actually up on a rolling 12-month basis, although that conceals the fact that online sales have leapt by more than half this year, taking much away from bricks and mortar shops and that the increases for grocers are actually not as quite as large as they seem. They're being bumped up by transfers of spending from businesses such as cafes, bars, pubs and restaurants. During the first lockdown, we surveyed 1,500 high street businesses and asked them how things were. More than four in 10 said they had no income whatsoever, while a third said they had a fraction of their normal income. Four out of 10 said they needed cash urgently to keep going at all. Another four out of 10 said they needed it just to lengthen the amount of time they could continue with, a, with any hope of uh, longer term survival. So the challenges of basic business administration, managing cash, controlling costs, and both for now and looking forward, getting funds into the business are more difficult than ever. Helpfully, today we have with us a panel of experts today to answer the many questions around this challenging area. If I could ask them in turn to introduce themselves, just literally say who they are and what their organisation is so everyone watching knows who we've got on the line, then I'll get into the questions. In alphabetical order, by first name, we have Finn. Sorry, hi. Um, so I'm here with my colleague Rachel today um, on behalf of our pledge, which is a um, which runs a help to buy, help to supply scheme um, in which we get um, customers to pre pledge um, money um, to small businesses in order to um, kind of allow them to try on new products, um, particularly focusing on environmental um, offerings. So, okay. Yeah, thanks, Ben. No, that's great, and we'll come back to that later. Fraser Bell, I've seen you before, I'm sure. Yes, hi, I'm Fraser. I work as customer success lead for Save the High Street and also uh, Joe, our business support programme. Thank you. Jamie? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Jamie. I'm a founder at Industrious Energy. Uh, we are uh, a utilities brokerage uh, or utilities consultancy, so we help businesses reduce the cost on their utilities and, and keep them low long term. Okay, do we have Joe on? Don't Afternoon, so. everyone. Oh, yeah, um, Sorry, the dark. Missed no you. Problem at all. I'm Joe. I work for Fidelity Payment as head of heart, uh, partnership development. Uh, we specialise in card payment solutions. So any sort of card payment, whether that's card present all the way through to e-commerce. We specialise in integrations and also reducing your card processing fees. Great. Thank you. Michael. Uh, Michael Eretius uh, from Heighton Accountants and Tax Advisors. Uh, we deal with small businesses, medium-sized businesses, shops, offices, advisors, basically most P 
people who require accountancy services. Thank you very much. And only last alphabetically, Rachel. Hi, Michael. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm Rachel. I'm from Athledge. I work with Finn. He's already um, given you an insight to what we do. Thank you. So I want to start, if that's OK, um, with some very basic things. Um, cash. I'd like to bring Michael in first of all, because accountants have this X-ray view of many, many different types of businesses, but in great detail. They know really how they're working. Michael, at the moment, given the challenges which the high street have got, especially if these income and other issues are working out as they did during the first lockdown, would you care just to talk a bit about those basic disciplines that businesses should be carrying on, forecasting, chasing money, negotiating terms of supplies, online accountancy, things like that, and actually comment on whether in your, your opinion <laughs> they're doing it right or not? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So as, as Michael's already uh, said, uh, cash is the lifeline of any business. Um, and that's why we need to respect cash and we need to know our numbers. Um, if you don't know your numbers and are just happy to look at a bank balance and say, yeah, there's a bit of cash in there and I can spend it, um, then you'll be in a position where that cash runs out uh, in such instances as we are now. Uh, and then you're looking for assistance from everywhere else. Um, now, with that obviously goes your costs. You need to look at your costs. Um, you need to try and minimize your costs. Uh, you need to look at your personal expenses. So it, it's really, running a business is an, o an overall view, uh, if, I could, if I could explain it in that way. In other words, you're running a business to give yourself an income. Okay, so what income do you need to actually live on uh, right after your, your business expenses? Uh, you need to understand that concept uh, and then also to be able to look forward to say, okay, so this is the income I need. What is um, my sinking fund for argument's sake? Um, what do I need to put to one side? Should my income be affected in any sort of way. Uh, Costs-wise, you can look at many things from an accountant's point of view, uh, the on-surge of online accountancy software. Uh, it is a fantastic um, improvement to accountancy and to businesses to be able to uh, upload your invoices, uh, to be able to connect your bank and be able to see where you are, um, who you need to pay very quickly, uh, as long as the systems are, are, are kept up to date. Uh, and it, it tells you your numbers. And many, of, many bits of software will actually even forecast for you what your anticipate, anticipated income is going forward based on historical information. Of course, it takes a bit of time to load that information on, but your accountant should be able to help you with the historic information uh, and compare months by months if you want that information. And you should want that information. You should know where your business is. You should know that although your bank balance says you've got 5,000 pounds there, you've actually really only got 1,000 pounds. So it's knowledge. It all boils back down to knowledge and knowing where your business is. Costs, you have to weigh up the cost. Is it worth knowing your numbers? Or is it not worth knowing your numbers? If the cost of knowing your numbers is 10 or 20 pounds a month, is that worth it? So do you find, I mean, I'm familiar with a, a species of um, high street operator, which I would term a biscuit tin trader, yeah. um, where they gather together receipts and things like that. And, and at some point or other, take them to an accountant, plonk them on the desk and expect a set of accounts to um, churn out. I never quite understand how businesses operating on that basis also have a bank because you think the bank might be paying some attention to it as well. But is the biscuit till tin trader alive and well? Yes, very much alive and well. And they normally turn up in January <laughs> and uh, normally turn up with a, a bag. Nowadays, they, they tend not to use biscuit tins, but it's normally a throwaway bag um, with a munched up bunch of receipts. Uh, and uh, which are very difficult to read. 
uh, because a lot of them have faded. But expect also a turnaround within 24 hours of, of, their, of their work. Um, very difficult, of course. Uh, but yes, they are still alive and thriving, unfortunately. I mean, my own business, I've got to say, I'm sure I couldn't run it without the help of, I have a, a, a regular accountant and an online system. So I use um, Free Agent, mm -hmm. which he supplies. So, you know, I don't have to buy this separately. The accountant supplies it. He can look at my accounts. I can look at my accounts. We can resolve queries and so forth. Yeah. Do you, I mean, there are a lot of these things. Can you just run through which ones there are? I mean, do you have any favorites, for example? We, we mainly use uh, QuickBooks, um, but Zero is out there, Free Agent. Uh, there's many, there's many others um, that you can that you can download with a basic bookkeeping package uh, with no fee at all. The only time a fee normally uh, is uh, required is if you want additional functionality to the program. Um, QuickBooks has been very aggressive in the market uh, with their pricing. Uh, they have an online version for um, individuals, uh, i.e. the construction workers, uh, um, contractors, uh, some advisors, which is very basic, may cost you about four pounds a month. Uh, and then you can move up to the next level, which is all singing or dancing, um, bank reconciliation, VAT returns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but yeah, as accountants, we've had to sort of um, uh, evolve ourselves uh, and gone are the days where everyone uses Sage Line 50. Uh, and we've, you know, moved on to using all, whatever the client's comfortable with. You know, if somebody comes into the office and they, they they want to use free agent then by all means use free agent you know we're not going to push anybody onto one particular program uh we'll use whatever uh as long as it works and as long as it gives us the information that we need then we'll use whatever we can and i think it's fantastic these uh these bits of software being out there uh, to help individuals uh, and individuals in business who want to know their numbers yeah, it's interesting that I think there's a tie in here with open banking, isn't it? Which when I first saw it come along, say, you know, other organisations will be able to look at your bank details. I think I'm not sure I like that. But actually, free agent as an example, and my bank works beautifully because it reads the transactions as they come through. Do they all do that? Or is that just a speciality of a few? Um, any, anybody that's any software that's got the open uh, banking facility will do that. Uh, but there's other bits of software as well um, that will uh, analyze your receipts for argument's sake. So you don't even have to keep your receipts nowadays. Uh, QuickBook Zero, you can take a picture of your, uh, of your receipt and upload it straight into the software, um, which means you don't need to have, keep receipts uh, and have a bag full of receipts to give to anybody. Um, you know, there's other bits of software that link on that analyze um, bank statements for you, um, will they have the added uh, OCR functionality, which will actually read the receipt and put it in the right uh, area for you. So, you know, if it's if it's fuel that you've purchased, it will drop it into the fuel section in the accounts. Uh, so, yeah, it, software has come a long way. Uh, and f for me personally, whatever the cost, it, it saves you money in the long run. I was told that there was a difference among them, for example, when you get into certain types of business, such as ones which has significant amounts of stock. Now, high street businesses, particularly if they're you know, non-food or food retailers, do tend to have that. And they have a lot of, a lot of money tied up in them. Is there, a, is there a favorite for that type of business or a few favorites? Sage, I guess. Uh, sage, but to be, Sage, I would have said Sage initially, um, however, all the newcomers to the market, because I think because their software is more open to add-ons from other companies, you can literally buy stock control software that bolts on. You know, and that can be that can be to your budget. Uh, and yeah, and, and there's many out there, um, many different products that you can bolt on, and the software. Um, that is open in that way, 
can be, become a huge, huge asset, not just knowing your numbers, just a huge asset to everything that you do. I think the subject of stocks been coming up for Fraser, uh, because Fraser talks to um, high street businesses on projects, but also uh, nationally as well. Um, managing it, making sure people don't have too much of an investment in it, um, I think is something that comes up for you fairly regularly, isn't it, Fraser? Yeah, so I think just um, I guess building on on what, what Michael's already already said, you know, there's there's sort of two parts to it. One is reducing the amount of of capital that's tied up in stock, and then secondly, from a I guess a, a merchandising perspective or a retailing perspective, making the most of of what you put out in front of customers um, and your your shelf space. And I guess at this time that we've been speaking with businesses, there's a few questions that we've been suggesting that they they ask themselves so firstly do you know how much stock you have and a lot of a lot of people we work with it might just be that you know they're doing a, a, a stock take um sort of every six months or every year and discovering things that you know they didn't know they had and and the aim with with those people is to to try and move them towards something that's electronic um and that each time they get um something in from their suppliers they combine any electronic record of that with with their new sort of their new records so they can update their own figures um i guess there's also sort of building again on what michael was saying is there any way what are we connecting that that stock list to so for a lot of a lot of retail businesses specifically can we get our point of sale system talking to the the stock management system for example and and ultimately that's going to enable us to be a lot smarter about what stock have we had for a long time? How quickly do things come in and get sold? What's selling the most? What's selling the least? And it just opens up kind of all of the possibilities to um, to sort of smarten, smarten things up. And I guess a lot of business owners that aren't currently doing those things at the moment, they say, you know, they obviously have opinions about what works and what doesn't, but there's always something when we look at the actual data that, that surprises people. Um, and I guess, in terms of sort of what what some of the output of that will be if we find that there's stock that, that we've had for for a long time or and, and that's maybe potentially quite valuable um maybe it's about getting it out into in front of customers more prominently in the shop um, and running a campaign or a sale on it or even looking at can we go and find somewhere online where things that we've had for months or years that, that haven't seen an interest sort of locally on our high street can they go to a marketplace online um, either because they've just you know over ordered on something and we can learn from that for next time or just because there isn't a sort of local demand for a specific niche product but by going online to a marketplace ebay or, or any other place there might be someone nationally or even internationally who can help kind of clear that that stock and, and get some some capital back to buy um, more popular products. I guess that um, relationships with suppliers are pretty critical there because of course they might be a route to get rid of something which isn't selling well or an overstock of something because of course they'll both be looking to a long-term relationship, aren't they? Yeah, and I think there's obviously everyone right now is is under in, in the whole supply chain is under a lot of pressure and has been this year, but I suppose we've, we've seen cases where businesses we work with have asked the question of, can you take back some excess inventory from us? And, and they've said yes, or they've managed to renegotiate contracts for, or, or less, slightly reduce orders for upcoming collections and things like that. Um, so it's, it's sometimes worth, worth asking the, the questions. Okay. I, I guess just finally to say for those that are not selling sort of physical products, but are selling services, the same sort of principles of analysis can apply. You know, do you have a clear grasp of what your capacity is in your team for different different services? Um, that's really the starting point. And then you can can look at um, and, uh, sort of what the, the patterns are from there once you've got that clear view of it. Okay, thank you. One pattern which has changed this year. Um, I'm well aware, is um, the use of cash. Now, cash, um, for many years, people have been arguing, oh, cash is being driven out of the high street. It's certainly been driven out of the high street for health and safety reasons at the moment. Um, 
I've got to admit, I had 60 quid in my wallet um, at uh, in April, and I think I've still got 40 of those quids in there at the moment. I'm not unusual in that respect. I haven't been out a lot, but you know, the cards have become significant, much more significant than they were um, uh, on high street. So I want to bring Joe in, if I may, because I mean, the cost of the cost of transactions has always been significant for high street businesses and there's always been for example a cost of banking cash hasn't there what's happening in the in the payments uh, charge market joe i think you know as as you've said we've we've seen albeit you know a difficult financial year for many businesses we we still are seeing you know card payments sort of stay steady among many sectors i mean there's obviously some like hospitality where it's it's dissipated completely because you know everything's closed but you know we we are you know we're seeing year on year growth in card payments in comparison to cash uh, i think last year might have been the first year where there were more card payments than there were cash and that's only growing now obviously because of you know the the contactless aspects where you know people are worried about you know a certain virus that's going around and you know they don't really want to be handing cash to each other um, but we've also seen a big drive in e-commerce sales as well, where, you know, some high street stores may have had to close um, if they're deemed as maybe not essential, but they still want to be selling their product. So, you know, with that, we've seen a, an increase in e-commerce sales where people might be selling either more, more product over their, their websites because you know, they can't open their store and people are, are less keen to go out and actually visit places as well. Um, so, so there's been a drive there, which is, you know, sort of been great for us in, in you know, a, a tough financial year. It's, it's sort of kept us going because car payments are really, you know, taking over and the landscape is changing. Um, so that's why I think we've, we've been okay during this difficult period because, you know, if we're reaching out to businesses that are, you know, finding it hard and, you know, want to be able to continually sell whichever product is they, they're selling, you know, we can advise on, you know, in integrating a, a checkout onto their web page or introducing them to a, a virtual terminal piece of software, which effectively is a, a, a card terminal in your computer that you can then take payments over the phone. And, you know, it's still a very secure way to do so. Um, so I think, you know, that, that sort of change in, in consumer behaviour, um, coupled with decent savings that we can provide and you know this year especially anyone that can make a saving of any description is you know very keen to do so you know i think coupling the, the move from from cash to e-commerce and then also saying you know we can give you a 25 percent saving off the bat for your card payments it's been a you know an okay year for us um, so i think all in all yeah we are seeing movement away from cash uh, especially in you know retail and, and industries like that, um, but I think it's just making sure that, that businesses are equipped with the the solutions that you know they can keep their business afloat during these these changing times. So you're suggesting you, that there are actually savings to be made, and I know that's one of the things your business does. So demand is rising for card transactions, uh, but prices of transactions aren't. Are they coming down? What's what is the trend? It's a funny one. I think if you look at the, the, the sector as a whole in terms of card payments, you know, some of the, the bigger names almost have an that loyalty isn't rewarded, which is obviously a shame. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very rare that we can't, you know, be introduced to a new business or, or speak to a new business and find a, a really good saving straight away. I mean, I think our, our typical saving is between 25 and 30 percent against an existing provider. Um, and that's that's down to two things, really. Uh, the first one is obviously, as you all know, each card type bears a, a percentage weight card fee against it. So a debit card might be 0.35%, a credit card might be 0.75%. You know, we'll always be able to shave some, some percentage points off that. But I think the big one is uh, removing non-secure or premium charges. And I think that's, you know, especially poignant, poignant in what's going on at the minute, because a non-secure charge would be a charge that's added to a transaction that's that's not card present. So any transaction that isn't done with you putting your card, you know, your credit card into the terminal or tapping it on the terminal is deemed as a non-secure transaction. And this is because years ago, 
um, it was, you know, security wasn't quite as good as, as it is now. It was less secure to pay e-commerce or, you know, to pay over the phone. So there was a, a non-secure fee added years ago. This has been totally scrapped now, yet some banks still add this non-secure fee as a way to generate a bit more revenue for themselves. So whereas you may be quoted by your bank as 0.35% for your debit cards, however, hidden fee of 0.8% every time you take a payment, that's not card present. So we scrap those straight away. So that's where we can make a big saving straight away with any businesses that we speak to. It's sort of a you know, removal of that straight away, partnered with you know, shaving a few points off your, your current rates. It's, you know, it's very rare that we can't find a good saving. I had a really dumb question, a question I couldn't answer the other day. Somebody said, my shop is closed, but I've got a terminal. If I hold it up against the window and somebody taps their card against the window, is that A, possible, and B, is that cardholder not present? I have no idea of the answer to that. Uh, I'll be honest, that's a question I've not heard either. Um, I mean, it, I suppose maybe it depends how thick the glass is. I don't know. Um, I think, I mean, it probably could happen. I mean, there's, there's solutions I'd recommend against doing that, uh, one being a virtual terminal where you would just log on to your, your laptop or your computer and the, the terminal would pop up and you'd plug the card details in and that, trans that transaction would go through that way. Um, but honestly, the answer to that question, I, I, I don't know. I'm, all I'd say is I wouldn't recommend it. No, we might try it. We might try that. I wanted to come to Jamie. Um, it's another savings question when we're looking at costs. Hmm. Um, haven't we all swapped and shifted our accounts to death now? There can't be anything left, surely. Can there? <laughs> Well, I'd hope so, but no, there, there is. There's loads. Um, as I say, you know, we, we're an energy consultancy, so we we speak to people all the time who have gone out of contracts, and and it's the biggest it's the biggest frustration because um, these guys are these companies are potentially paying over over fifty percent more for their energy or for any of their utilities than if they if they weren't switching regularly. Um, so uh, so yeah, no, it's I, I think one of the now, one of the big good examples at the moment is, is look after my bills on the residential side. They've, they've done fantastically because uh, they, they automatically switch customers um, as, soon as, as soon as their energy comes up to the end. And, and that's what we are doing as a, as a, as a business. Um, but some people just aren't that worried about their, their business energy and are letting it, um, letting it expire past their, past their contract end dates. Um, and as, as you well know, you know, as soon as your contract ends, the variable rate kicks in and it's about about yeah, double what you would have been paying during your contract now it used to be the case and this is ignorance again that because there are different rules uh, governing um, relations with consumers from businesses um, contracts rolling over of for businesses although not for consumers could be deemed to have renewed is that all gone in history now or is any of that still lurking around? It's all gone, especially for the top six. I think some of the smaller players actually do it still, uh, but top six, you're, you're really safe. The only thing is that you will pay a variable rate, which is probably double the amount that you're, you're paying. Um, and you, it will take about 30 days to get out of that contract as well. So what we're saying to customers is if you are, you need to be looking two months before the end of your contract, you need to be looking at what your next one's going to be or coming to someone like us and looking at what your next one's going to be because it's going to take a few weeks or so to get your bills together, to get it procured. And then it's going to, once you've signed all the documents, it's going to take a month for you to cancel your contract, get out of it on time so you can just roll on with the lower rate. So, um, so yeah, we're saying that it's, it's no good doing it in the last month because you'll end up paying some variable rate you need to look at mi the absolute minimum two months before your end of your utility contracts you need to be coming and looking out but consumers have cooling off periods because these are distance contracts is that true of businesses also uh, i don't think it is no once you sign up to an electricity contract you are signed up um whether that's a year or three years and you you can't get out of it um unless you pay your way out of it which obviously no there's no point doing so uh, no, once you're in, you are tied to that amount. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, you'll know the answer to this at Industrious. I don't. I got a lovely letter from my um, energy supplier a few weeks ago, and it said, avoid the huge increase. Sign up for this fix. When I looked at it, the fix was still a huge increase as well. But yeah. It wasn't as big as the variable one. What's going on? Is it all yeah. going up again? Yeah. Uh, th there's various tactics they use, whereas, you know, that, that's a really nice tactic to just get you on, get you onto a normal rate and continue on. 
um, some of them will just ignore you. <laughs> and, and, and there's about 20, 30% of, of businesses that just go on to a variable rate and keep it there. Um, you know, we find that with bigger businesses rather than smaller businesses and, and people that um, perhaps they own their business so they know everywhere every penny is. Um, because, you know, some of these large businesses, they run by, a, you know, certain, certain people who don't really mind about the bottom line so they can get away with doubling their energy uh, bills. Um, but yeah, for the smaller businesses, I think they, they know uh, the impacts of, of saving a pound here and there. Um, you know, saving, saving one pound is the same as generating 10 pounds of revenue in a lot of businesses. Um, so that's why the, the, those small savings can really make a big difference. Do I remember correctly that you also do broadband contracts? We do. We, we can procure broadband contracts. I'm not the expert on that, but... No, that's a, but the, uh, the question was, Jamie, yeah. are, people, are people upgrading during this pandemic? Because I was, on a, I was on a webinar the other day, which I wasn't running, so it ran smoothly. Yeah. And um, they, uh, the, the question came up about, you know, what we would have done if we'd been running this, or trying to deal with this pandemic 10 years ago. Hmm. Some people say, well, I still had a modem 10 years ago for dial up and so forth. And actually, the story was about, you know, the rollout of much higher speed. Do we know if people are upgrading or are they trying to save money on their broadband at the moment? It's because no, it, it? some people are upgrading. Um, my, I, I, whenever anybody asks me about that, I really put an air caution on it. And you, you really need, you know, the, the mega the, advertising now uh, well one do you need it you know are you gaming and are you streaming those stuff you know and, and two can you even access it you know even if you do go for the for the for the big um, big packages can you even access 30 30 gigs and all this kind of stuff so i uh, you know it, it really for me depends on how many users what they're doing um, if it's even worth it um because you can easily you know half your bill if you really don't need you know what, what they're advertising mm. well i think we all need it at the moment especially people running websites and doing lots of video conferencing, whether correctly or not. Um, there was another cost thing I was talking to Fraser about the other day, and it was about um, uh, music licensing and music in stores. Now, music licensing in stores, which are closed at the moment, will get a short, sharp answer from many people. But let's assume this all opens and, and they start blasting out Noddy Holder again, telling us about the future. Um, you had some comments on this. I think you've been talking to some people I think mainly in Waltham Forest, but other places, Fraser, and some ideas around saving money there. Yeah, so there's 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 two categories, as you mentioned, Michael. Um, one is if your business has been closed, it's worth getting in touch with um, any existing licensing provider that you pay as they will issue you a credit for the time that you've been closed. So if you've been closed not playing music in your shop, you should be able to extend your license um, without without paying. So that's the first group. The second group is those people that are maybe coming to the end of um, their, their contract with PRS for Music or one of the other common um, licensing bodies. And for those businesses, there are other options outside of um, using those, those main bodies. So there are different companies and one that we work with at Save the High Street is called Regu, who have their own effectively catalogs of music that you can pay a license fee to use. Um, and they'll, all, they'll, they'll often come out significantly cheaper than the hundreds or thousands of pounds a year that PRS and, and the main providers um, tend to cost. And so effectively you're paying for a separate catalogue of music with their own um, artists that these groups have signed. And I think it's maybe an interesting time to consider partly just if you're approaching the end of your contract, but also if you're thinking about um, reopening your business, whether that's in December or in the new year. Um, maybe it's an opportunity to change up the atmosphere in your shop and look at different playlists, different um, different artists and a different customer experience as well. So yes, it's something that we've been you know, having a few conversations about in Waltham Forest. So presumably with the playlists, I don't know, a custom playlist possibly you're able to kind of align the sounds with your brand as well, I guess. Yeah, so most of these services will offer sort of tested and curated playlists with different moods and different atmospheres. So depending on if you're a retailer, what kind of retailer you are, um, if you're in kind of hospitality or, or services as well, you can uh, get, get what you're looking for. A few years ago, I went to um, a large um, European exhibition for retail and they had all this kind of stuff in there. They also had a machine 
where you can dial in smells and it will puff smells. I mean, we're all familiar with the, the blown smell of um, baking bread coming from bakeries and supermarkets, but this allowed you to dial in any, any of up to 200 smells. So you can have sort of tobacco and leather and things like that, or, or freesias and so forth. It was a charming thing to do. But I mean, actually that kind of conditioning the atmosphere for um, shoppers, not particularly relevant to many at the moment, but I think, you know, useful stuff to think about going forward. I have to bring us back, I think, to, um, to money, um, closer to money anyway. So I'll be asking Michael about this at the moment. We talked a little bit before we started about, and this is not something you actually will get directly involved in, but you'll be asked by all of your, your, your clients. So there are, there are grants for businesses which are closed and that's, rated, that's related to business rated businesses and the as yet unknown locally discretionary grants for businesses which don't quite fit the bill with money being given i think at the rate of 20 quid per head per population to each of the local authorities to then decide how they're going to do it are people asking you questions about this michael uh, yes they are uh, and um in respect of the grants for closed businesses that is pretty much set um, and if you've had to close then you need to and you haven't applied yet to your local government then you need to apply very simple um if if you're looking for the discretionary grants again you need to apply uh but that is down to the wording of your application <laughs> um and uh, what case you can actually put forward uh, to be able to actually get something from uh, from local government it's uh you know you, you've got to um i have had a couple of clients who applied previously for such grants uh, and basically you have to show that your um that your business has been affected um and by how much so for argument's sake, what was your turnover last year for the same period, and what's your turnover this year? Uh, so, yeah, things like that. It, it, that's the information that they require, or you require, really, to um, be able to uh, justify the request. Okay. Um, staff are a big cost for businesses. Um, yeah. Of course, the businesses don't work without the staff, so in that sense, you know, that's not, not, not a big killer. The staff, they're really expensive, you mustn't get some. Um, but furloughing is back. Um, uh, I think running until March, but being reviewed at the turn of the year as well. Yes. We, we found during our surveying um, over the summer particularly, that half of, um, slightly over half of high street businesses had furloughed either half or all of their staff. Um, is this a common experience with you? And do your people come to you for advice about how to make sure they're getting what they should do? Okay, so um, yes, in respect of um, clients coming to us to establish what they should get um, and how that will actually be paid to them, when it will be paid to them, uh, and what are the restrictions around people working and is there any contribution that they need to make when it when furlough first came into effect um i think quite a lot of businesses panicked immediately uh, and put a lot of their staff onto furlough uh, although they may not have had to um you know uh, and uh, and it was a, it was a little bit more um uh, more beneficial because you had the contribution to the employer's pension and also the national insurance um to be fair i was probably uh, i was dreading the job retention scheme that was to come into play uh because i've spoken to quite a lot of our clients who have staff and they couldn't really see the benefit of having that scheme um, it was just going to cost them too much, uh, especially when income had been reduced uh, and they were looking to make people redundant. Uh, so I'm pleased that the furlough scheme's back. Okay, it's not as good as the first time, 
because employers still have to pay the pension and the employer's national insurance, but at least the staff get that 80% uh, payment um, for the work that they're not carrying out. So if you have someone fully furloughed, i.e. they're not carrying out any work with, with you, then you can claim that 80%. If they're working part-time, maybe half the time that they did before, you pay them for that half, for that 50%, uh, and then they get 80% of the other 50%. So it's a simpler, it's a simpler method, even for us to calculate. Um, and, and it gives as much as possible. As, I'd love it to be 100%, but let's face it, it's not going to happen. Um, yeah. OK, um, so it's 80%, but with contributions on pensions and national insurance from the employer. Mm -hmm. uh, it is flexible, which is something that was being asked for particularly previously. Yeah. The job retention bonus has kind of disappeared into the ether, depending yeah, on- We haven't heard when... much more about that. Um, so you know, <laughs> we're eagerly looking at dispatches. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that, but um, it's gonna be significant for a lot of businesses, I think. Yeah. And then I just wanted to turn actually, if I might then from, you know, that, that's a big issue, which concerns a lot of people, both the employers and the employees as well. Do you do payroll, by the way? Do you actually we have do. to get into- you say you get right into calculating all of this. Oh yes, yes, yeah. We we provide payroll so um, to our to our clients, and th that means that we do end up calculating everything. Um, and I was quite, yeah, and I was quite pleased to see actually with the announcement that the key date at which an employee must be on the payroll to qualify for this new furlough exactly. team, thirtieth yeah. October, um, there has to be an RTI real time information posting so, about yeah. then. So that's quite good, and I also saw that. If somebody had made redundant um, by the, about the 23rd of October, they could actually ask ask the employer to be taken back in. So yeah. very it, significant moves there. Very significant moves, but from the employer's perspective, uh, and this may be a little bit controversial, uh, but from the employer's perspective, um, okay, so you, you keep a member of staff on, let's say, let's say you don't make them redundant, and because you have got the furlough, um, you, you're, you keep a member of staff on, which you'd want to do. Under employment law, their holidays are still ticking. Mm -hmm. So you, you, it's another liability that you're building up where your business, um, even on recovery, may not be in a position to actually keep that member of staff employed. Or may, you may need to reduce your, your staffing levels. So I know it's a bit controversial, but it is something that employers need to think about. Um, you know, we all want to keep staff on as much as possible. Um, and maybe the government should have thought about just tweaking that law a little bit uh, just to help businesses out a bit more in a roundabout way. Now, I'm feeling really guilty that I've, I've asked um, Rachel to come along to talk about a really great idea they've got, which relates to something I'm going to come back to Michael again on in a second, which is about getting funds into your business. When we looked um, at, um, you know, we looked at um, bounce back loans and so forth, still available, term extended, uh, repayment term extended. So a lot of work has been done there and a lot of business has taken back bounce back loans. But others, we found that they, the primary access to you know, funds coming into a, comp a company during that summer when we were doing this uh, survey with 1500 businesses was family and friends. Basically, business owners lending money to their businesses, not necessarily shelling, selling shares to their mum or whatever, but putting money in. Rachel and Finn, and talk with, you know, share it between you, but you've got a very different approach to the whole idea of getting money into companies haven't you yeah um we do it's it's good to be talking about our pledge from this perspective actually i mean we usually and this is fantastic as well we want to be doing this um we usually come from a sustainability perspective um but absolutely one of the things that was a motivation for setting up our pledge was thinking about business customer relationships supply and demand relationships stock relationships a lot of the things that we've touched on already today. And I founded our pledge before 2020 became 2020, um, thinking about a lot of these things. Um, and 
just just to give you a, a kind of snapshot and, and Finn already um, mentioned this, but I was looking at all the gaps where I wanted to shop sustainably and environmentally as a, as a consumer, but just wasn't able to do that. And so I was looking for a solution where I could say to shops, like local shops, you know, and I love my local high street. I want to shop locally. I want to support small businesses. How do I keep doing that and be a climate conscious consumer? And so I thought about this option where, well, what about if I tell these shops that I'm going to pay for these products, will they supply them? And so as Finn said, I invented ourpledge.co.uk, which is a pledge to buy, pledge to supply platform. So it's a place where consumers like me can say to businesses, if you stock these things, I will, I will buy them. And here's my money. And we use a kind of crowdfunding model where obviously a business isn't going to go, oh, Rachel, fantastic that you want to buy these things. We'll stock a hundred of them. They need to know that there are as, as many of me as, as can prove a business case for the, for the businesses. And so um, we work at our pledge to assess where that sweet spot is, you know, how many people have to pledge to buy a product in order for you local business to supply it. We were doing that before the lockdown. Um, and as I said, sustainability was our, our impetus. Um, we ran a campaign, we've now run two campaigns, we're early stage, we're startup, um, but both of those have been in shops, in local shops, and they have been far more successful than we imagined and they've had benefits for the businesses that we didn't foresee so obviously if you think about it what happens in that that scenario is that a business is able to understand how many people are going to buy x product and get the cash flow so the everyone pledges to buy they put their card details in in the same way they would with crowdfunding and then the shop when when and we'll say like you need, need to, we need to make five thousand pounds from a hundred people let's say that's a real example only at the five thousand pound mark would that money ever be taken so if the demand isn't there the money's not taken and the products aren't bought but if you um reach your target then the money's taken and the business gets a lump sum of cash to go and invest in the products and the infrastructure so the, you've, you've talked about stock and that's one thing that's really come out of this from a business perspective is knowing that you have the cash to buy the stock and that people are going to buy it because they already have, if you see what I mean. Um, and then also um, by doing that, we're creating a system where um, the sales are going through our platform, which um, means that the uh, customers just go into the shop um, with their details, their, their voucher that we send them, their digital voucher, and can go and um, redeem their, their products from the uh, system in the shop, but they're not even using a card. They just automatically have a lump sum account in the, um, in the shop on their ecosystem. So just a couple of things that you've already spoken about there that we're sort of accidentally um, touching on by doing what we're doing. Uh, and we, like everyone else, we were affected by the lockdown. We didn't know if businesses were going to want to continue, if we, they were going to be there for us to work with. And actually, we've got multiple businesses um, in conversation about running campaigns, you know, retailers, um, convenience shops, um, cafes and restaurants, uh, pet shops, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a range of shops that are, that are there and their customers want to support them. They're there, they're ready to spend money. They know they're going to they're going to have to buy, you know, dog food. They're going to have to buy pasta, you know, all these things that they have got in their budget. They want to put that money towards local shops. And that's what we're enabling them to do. So that's the okay. average model. Can I ask Finn? I mean, just so I can understand this, uh, they do their pledging on, on your website. Um, what's, what's the sort of customer journey for this? Uh, what happens inside the shop? Do they do a little sign up saying, go here, give us money there for that. Can, can you just talk us through that a bit, Finn, please? Oh uh, yeah, no worries. Um, so at the moment, because um, we haven't run very many campaigns, you know, we're kind of very early on. Um, a lot of our um, experience has actually been through the shop itself. Um, so it's often through their kind of social media presence. Um, they're also often advertising these things in the shop. Um, further down the line, we want to kind of generate a community of shops that will work together as well so it will have a kind of certification system where you know we've got stickers on the front of their window saying yes this is not a pledge shop um you know we 
we are running crowdfunding campaigns. Um, so yeah, I think that that is really kind of um, the ways that we've been, been approaching it at the moment. Which is more difficult, getting this message to the shops so they understand it, or getting it to the consumers so they understand it? Or are they both difficult? It's been, it, it's it's a different model to that, you know, people aren't really used to. Um, and so it's, you know, we do get a lot of frequently asked questions. It's something we've been working on recently, actually, um, <laughs> on the website. Um, but certainly once people understand how it works, they're very, very kind of excited and really willing to either put their money down or get involved with the campaign itself. Mm, okay. Well, thank you for that. Michael, we were talking a little bit earlier about other um, sort of funding um, arrangements which people have had. Um, you might talk about how businesses have used those in high streets, but I've got a feeling also we were talking about that government support in some ways may have disrupted that market a bit mm -hmm. over the last year. Um, it, it, has, um, it has to a certain extent. Uh, however, those companies um, have looked at other areas uh, of how to um, support people uh, and businesses. Uh, for argument's sake, um, funding circle, uh, you know, we, I don't know about the others, but you get bombarded with, you used to get bombarded with uh, letters asking you to take out loans or approach them or, or invest in them. Um, and they seem, uh, they are only doing bounce back loans in Sybil's um, at, the, at the moment. Uh, and anybody who's borrowed money from them is basically repaying back those loan, the old loans or refinancing them with the with the new bounce back loans, etc. Um, but there's there's companies out there now who, um, for argument's sake, will look at grants uh, across the board for you, uh, and it's not just the government grants, the COVID general grants. But you've got to have a reason to be looking for those grants, you know, an innovation or um, an improvement to your business in some way. So again, it's got to be justified. The reason's got to be justified why you're looking for that. Uh, things that have come along uh, are, um, if you're open for business, uh, are loans for, um, for your actual till receipts, the, the money that goes through your till, uh, which are repaid daily by direct debit um, from deductions from your till. So uh, these companies will, yeah, these companies will look at your um, your turnover and your daily transactions from your EPOS system, um, assess how much loan uh, of a loan they can give you, uh, give you that loan, and then the repayment will come out daily from your credit card payments. You know the debit card, credit card payments that you're taking. So that can be. Uh, quite useful if you need a quick injection, but that you're open. <laughs> so, so Joe, I mean, is that something which rings a bell with you? Yeah, it is. It is. It's not something that we directly do ourselves. We're very much focused on the actual card processing, you know, those transactions and and facilitating that. We we do have a couple of businesses that we work with because, you know, it is it's a question. I wouldn't say we're regularly asked, but we have been asked it. I think if you if you think of businesses such as maybe vet practices that you know need a lump sum loan to to buy some new top of the range equipment, you know it's a way that they can get that quick loan and then make those repayments through through each of their card sales. So, you know we we work with companies that do that. It's not something we push ourselves. Um, you know if we are asked it, we have a couple of companies that we can recommend to use it that we know you know, work, work well. But yeah, I've, I've heard of it many times, but it's not something that we proactively do ourselves. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to terrify you all now because against the background of all of that and issues around sort of funding and loans and stuff, I have been picking up separately, first from um, businesses and then consumers, but also actually from lenders criteria that lenders have tightened up very significantly um, on businesses or individuals who've taken any form of government support over the last nine months. As the story is developing, and we will see more of it, I saw it in the Observer at the weekend, 
So, for example, we fir I first picked this up in August when we got hold of the lending criteria for a range of um, banks for mortgages for a business. So this is asset backed lending. And two of them said, um, if you've taken any form of government support, including furloughing for your staff or, or bounce back loans, you will not be considered for a mortgage. Now, it's a big market and there'll be a lot of things going in with it. I find it personally really scary that at the point that we come out to this, and we are all feeling a bit more positive because of talk of vaccines and things like that, aren't we? You know, we can see maybe that there's light, I wouldn't say at the end of the tunnel, on the horizon at the very least, that actually what I'm really worried about is we might end up in a credit crunch at the end of this, which is the one thing we're probably not expecting. Anyway, we're coming to the end now uh, of the webinar. Um, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for coming. I'd really like to thank, in reverse alphabetical order by the first name, Rachel, mm -hmm. Michael, Joe, Jamie, Fraser and Finn for your expert contributions. I hope everyone found that useful. I always find this stuff fascinating. It's, it's the real, it's about the sort of biology of businesses and how they actually work and what keeps them going. The recording of today's webinar will be published shortly. We're, this is one of a series. As I said, next Wednesday, we're going to have a discussion on selling in new ways during lockdown. And I was looking today at this really good thing, which is a 360 of a shop with hotspots on the various different products that you can go through to a website. Or you can click on the person standing behind the counter and book an appointment because it's a tailoring and clothing company. So there's going to be some fascinating stuff on that. We're going to... Um, be looking also at people issues, really HR contracts, some of the stuff we've, we've touched on today um, with Michael, but also health and safety. And I've got to say, mental well-being among other types of well-being as well. And then on finally, on the first Tuesday, the 1st of December, when we're about to come down out of lockdown, hands up who thinks we're actually coming out of lockdown then? Yes, no, okay, see yourselves. We're gonna find out then. We're gonna turn our attention to marketing and the high street business as we move forward, because of course, Christmas is just beyond the end of that and the future lies beyond there. We hope you can all join us. Thank you all to our panel again to our panelists and um, I hope to see you all again soon. I'm going to end the, end the meeting now but thanks. Thank